going to look at uh, hands-off um, approaches to teacher development and student development, particularly focus on things like um, developing a school culture of touch points and trust, where you don't have to hands-on management manage every kind of aspect of the process, and you don't have to kind of tell the teachers exactly what to do. So they create that atmosphere in their classroom where they tell the students exactly what they do, where there's a little bit more reciprocity, I suppose, in the process. And this starts, from my context, uh, it starts from the process of teacher development and, and your first contact points with your teacher and how you view the development of the teacher. We've got a couple of different ones that you can look at, a couple of different processes you can look at in terms of teacher development. You've got workshops, which are typically your training focus on telling teachers what they should do, their requirements. Um, you've got mentoring, and that's uh, kind of helping teachers to reflect and moving them along in their kind of development on their own pathways, uh, whether it's novice teachers or it's uh, uh, performance improvement plans, um, teacher pathways, things like that. You've got action research or you've got PDGs, professional development groups, um, kind of groups that the teachers can get together and discuss issues with their own teaching and maybe uh, have knowledge share sessions with the rest of the teaching staff. There's a couple of different really hands-on approaches and really hands-off approaches. You've got, uh, with workshops, it's pretty much all touch point. It's all your teacher training. Uh, with professional development groups, it's very much a trust-led exercise where you um, give the teachers some topics where they can discuss and develop, um, and they, you let them go, essentially, for two months, and they go and discuss and they come back and present to the rest of the school. So there's a, a kind of a balance there in terms of your school culture and how that might feed in with how they view um, their own profession, I suppose. What I wanted to look at a little bit was, what is the connection between teacher development and student development, and how you treat your teachers and how teachers treat the students. And the whole idea, the whole ethos behind allowing teachers to develop students was the fact that the teacher journey becomes the student experience. The teacher journey, uh, uh, how the teacher views the development of their own process, is exactly what they regurgitate is the wrong word, but you know, they they push onto the, the student. The, the promotion of a school culture of um, an ethos of inquiry and, and an ethos of, of kind of friendliness and, and uh, positivity uh, around making mistakes, I think is quite important as well. And teachers are allowed to, to make mistakes and students are allowed to make mistakes. And a focus on teacher independence to push learner independence um, through the idea that your school is focusing on improving teacher behavior and learner behavior, not implementing knowledge. Implementing knowledge becomes a very uh, authoritarian process where you're, you're telling them this is the correct way to do things. You have to go and do it. And every time we appraise and observe and assess success, it's based on our criteria of success, our requirements. And the school views the teacher like this, and the teacher views the student like this. And we're going to try, or we have been trying, to, to take our hands off and, and, and trust that it could be a behavior-led process where we have certain behaviors we want the student to be able to improve, your can-dos, for example, and we want certain behaviors that we expect of the teacher and, and how we can promote that and how we can support that, but in a, in a, in a give-and-take kind of way. So, what, what does the teacher, the, in terms of implementing school culture and, and kind of uh, communicating school culture, what does the teacher, what is the key teacher contact point with the student? There's two requirements, essentially, the diagnose learner needs and fulfill learner needs. They're, they're your two essential requirements of the teacher's uh, role with the student. So you've got requirements and requests. These are the two requirements and everything else is, is your request. Everything else is your doors of opportunity. How the teacher is going to deal with that process. Traditionally, the teacher is dealing with the process by telling the student they have to do this, do the homework, correct the grammar. That's our knowledge-led process. Can we flip around to a behavior-led process where the teacher is encouraging the student to take control a little bit more? The teacher is still diagnosing and fulfilling, diagnosing and fulfilling, but the learner is coming to the teacher with the, um, the requirement, if that makes sense, or the, or the request, sorry. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Um, so, I'm particularly interested in looking at these little doors of opportunities. We have the things we have to do and we have the things we want to do. And, and the, the doors or the, the kind of windows of opportunity are where we can 
get it right in terms of school culture. Um, so I wanted to, um, I, want, I thought this really was a William Blake quote, but then when I looked at it, it's Ray Manzak from the doors. Uh, there are things you know and things you don't. Uh, the unknown and the unknown. And in between there are the doors. So this is what we were looking at, the doors of opportunity in between your requests and your requirements. Um, and, and seeing if you can implement your school culture there in between the top down and the bottom up and, and finding a bridge between what you have to do and what you want to do. So in conclusion, what we... Uh, oh, this is not in conclusion. It's the next slide. Um, one of the things that I... When, when I was looking at how we can do that, I looked at this British Council survey uh, 2020, or 2025, was it? 2025, which looked at, I think, 15 different European schools and the future of English language teaching. It's all available free online. And what type of teacher they will, we will need in 2025, for example. And a couple of different things kind of jumped up. We're going to need more flexible teachers, teachers who are um, able to personalize experiences for students, um, technologically capable, focusing on the role of assessment, and we can tell teachers to do this, or we can help them get there. Uh, and, and whatever they do, whatever we do with them, they're going to do with the students, essentially. So this was kind of a model for, for what I wanted to have as a, a long-term target. Um, so in conclusion, what I was looking at was the concept of nudging in an industry. Anybody who's read kind of marketing or advertising knows that nudging is a really uh, common concept in, in marketing and advertising of, of kind of subtle changes you can make in the environment or in the way you speak to people to kind of push them towards a common goal without telling them they have to do um, this certain thing. There's loads of different articles on nudging online. Some of them are really terrible. Some of them are, are quite useful. Um, but there's a couple of different strategies that they, they mention quite frequently um, in terms of how you can implement a, a system of, of nudges into your um, your management processes and into the way the teacher will uh, perhaps manage the, the students. And I'm, I'm just going to go through a couple of them really, really quickly, and I'm going to get you, if you want to go home, Google it and look up, because it's going to be a different, context, uh, different concept in each of your different contexts, I suppose. Pre-commitment strategies is really useful in getting people to promise to do things for themselves, not promising to do things for you. So it could be something as easy as, by the end of this week, this is what I will have studied, or this is what I will have focused on. Your Monday morning focus with the student to be able to get them to have a pre-commitment strategy, promise to themselves of the things that they will do today or this week. Again, you can do it with the teachers in terms of appraisals and uh, observations and things like that, but it, it's being able to get them to make promises to themselves where they're fulfilling it for themselves. And they can lie to themselves if they want, but that nudge is to remove you a little bit from the process and, and to, to allow them to, to promise themselves and, and fulfill or not. Little reminders of, of school cultures could be visual, could be oral, um, and it's just also the way if you're delivering workshops to include certain type of language that you want the students, to, the, the teachers to pass to the student, or even visual reminders and things like that um, on the walls. We've all seen when they have things with kind of really popular sports teams and successful sports teams, they always have you know the, the posters on the dressing room walls and these kind of little nudges just to remind you of the, the ethos of the club or the, the team. Uh, oh, Lake. Oh, I didn't realize I got the word wrong. Um, smart disclosure is uh, lying when appropriate, I guess. Kind of disclosing what people need to know and not disclosing what, what people don't need to know. Um, and it's quite an interesting thing of, of um, how much truth you're going to tell and how much you're going to hold back and, and how much do people need to know at certain, at certain points. Nudge units, uh, I really like that, that idea of having um, groups within the school. It could be in terms of teacher development or it could be student focus groups, uh, student groups who are, who are pushing certain things and they are the, the vanguard, I suppose, of the change that you want to see. And these little nudge units are, are really useful in, in, in kind of leading change or being that, that model for change. Uh, and then ease and convenience focus where you, you look at the things that you have to do and you make them as easy and convenient as possible. So for example, if you want the teacher to be able to, I don't know, uh, assess the students effectively, how can you set up the class in such a way to make that pretty foolproof? If you want the teacher to be able to treat the student like that, how can you make that as easy and convenient as possible? So it's rethinking those steps um, in order to, to kind of push that ethos a little bit. Okay, that was quick. <laughs> Any questions? No. Uh, I got perfect time.
like six minutes. <laughs> No, 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 Jing, the one that, that they always talk about is um, in the bath, they say uh, people like you have. In the bath? The bathroom of hotels. Yes. People like you have. It's wrong! <laughs> 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 uh, it's not the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's like the bathroom we're talking really about. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, people like you have helped us to, um, to save on our. Washing bills by uh, reusing your towels. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. That's a classic. That's a classic. No, even the cigarette pack with a picture of you know whatever. Else. That's a classic. Nudging, nudging, nudging. It's, it's, it's been able to implement. It's been able to implement them into your school and, and it, it reduces the workload, I suppose, on management of having to tell people all the time. If you create that that flow where it's an automatic part of what you do, and anybody coming into the company can see that's the the way you go. That's how an employee. Acts, that's how you treat a student. Um, it just makes everything easier, I suppose, long term. Can you give, give me a, a, an example of a nudge as opposed to a direction? Or a okay. Uh, so it, it could be something like um, course book use, of, of how much course book you use, and, and maybe a, a, a reminder in, in workshops, which we do quite regularly, that we don't work from the course book. So course books sometimes don't come into a workshop just to show people that you can set up a, a class without a course book. Yeah. And maybe the teacher and newer teachers can come in and say, oh, we're, we're planning everything without a course book. So maybe the ethos in this company is to teach the student, not teach the course book. Yeah. That, would be, that would be a case of, it's a visual reminder, but it's also, yeah, I suppose it's, it's I don't know what, what you actually call it. But it's, um, it's just a way of showing people that that's not how you do things. We don't come in and just open the course book and go like that. Yeah. And you can tell people every day that, or you can show it in your actions. You want something else? No. <laughs> but that's like but the way you arrange the chairs. Yeah. Yeah. Well, exactly. yeah. oh, it's not revolutionary, mm -hmm. but it's considering it. Yeah. It's considering how. Do, why do the teachers keep doing this? Why do they keep this? You know, why do they run a grammar test every Friday and not a test of skills? How can I nudge people in the direction of actually doing skills testing? Because that's what we want people to do. So the, the grammar at the bottom of the syllabus instead of putting it at the top. Yes. Yeah. Mm. So there's a, exactly there's little subtle changes you can make, but it's reconsidering that the way I'm treating the students, the teachers, is the way I'm treating the students. How can we change that ethos?